All right, good afternoon. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you for sticking with us and coming out today after our snowstorm two weeks ago. Hopefully it's not snowing outside now. Has anybody checked? I'm hearing that thunder out there. So, um, My name is Nicole Bigham, and I am president of the Food and Drug Law Association here at Delaware Law School. So I'm pleased to be working with Dr. Human Norshazam today. Um, Dr. Norshazam is a cardiothoracic surgeon in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He trained at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Norchasm is a devoted patient advocate, author, speaker, and father of six children. Dr. Norchasm met his wife, Amy Reed, in medical school at the University of Pennsylvania. Amy was an anesthesiologist and surgical intensive care physician. In October 2013, Amy underwent surgery to remove uterine fibroids through a laparoscopic procedure. The surgery involved the use of a medical device known as a power morselator. Shortly thereafter, it was discovered that Amy's fibroid was indeed cancerous. The morselation of the fibroid caused the cancer to spread throughout her abdomen, leading to Amy's untimely death in May of 2017. Amy's diagnosis of leiomyosarcoma served as the beginning of Amy and Human's extensive research on power morselation. As a result of their research, research Amy and Human began a quest to educate companies, lawmakers, the medical community, and the public about the dangers of power morselation. They also led, and Human continues to pursue regulatory reform efforts relating to FDA-approved medical devices. So today, Huma and I are going to try and pull off a little interview, interactive um, presentation for you guys. And we do really want it to be interactive. So as we're going through um, our question and answer, if you guys have questions, please feel free to raise your hands. And we'll try and address those questions as we go through. Um, but before we get started, um, a few years ago, Human and Amy um, presented at this very forum. Um, and hopefully, I can get this to work here. And we can see a little bit of that. So bear with me. Hello. You've covered everything. Um, I'm just going to give you a very, very brief. I'm sure our story's been in the news. There's been many pictures of us and whatnot. Um, and early in, early in 2013, um, I went and saw two gynecologists and one gynecological oncologist, so a surgeon who specials in uh, cancers of women's reproductive tract. After the birth of our sixth child, um, for some concerning issues I was having. And they all recommended the same thing. Um, they all said uh, a hysterectomy was the way to go. Um, I had every study um, that I could have had, MRIs, ultrasounds, um, biopsies, everything that's currently available. Um, and uh, with their recommendation, I underwent, underwent a laparoscopic uh, hysterectomy, um, taking off what I thought would be a couple of weeks from work. I was working full time um, up in Boston. And um, eight days later, I got a call that, um, I'm sorry we were wrong, it wasn't a benign condition you had. Uh, you have uh, what's known as leiomyosarcoma, which is a, a cancer of the uterus uh, that masquerades as fibroids. And so the treatment of sarcoma, or rather how um, the, the approach to sarcoma is um, surgery, and uh, removal with good margins, meaning you cut outside of the cancer, you don't leave any of the cancer behind, because once you disturb sarcomas, they can become very aggressive and spread. So um, the question that we asked was, did you get it all in one piece? And she said, um, no, I'm sorry, we morselated it. And that was the beginning of um, a very long journal. My husband here has a, do you have the morselator video? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it. Okay. You want me to yeah, you want to share that now? So as I said, uh, the treatment, the correct treatment for sarcoma is surgical resection in block, meaning all in one piece. And instead, they used a device that looks like this. Um, here you can see it shredding and dripping the pieces of tissue, blood, and in my case, sarcoma, um, throughout my abdomen. 
may may be worthwhile to so process this. This has, for the past 20 years, been used solely in the field of gynecology um, to remove masses from women's abdomens. If there is cancer in there, it will drip and spread. I just want you to note that this device is the Gynacare Morselator. You can see it says Gynacare on the point of entry in the abdominal cavity. That's a Johnson & Johnson product that was approved through the 510K mechanism and really has been on the market for about 20 years um, until we started our activity and Johnson & Johnson has voluntarily withdrawn this product, although there are other companies that are continuing to persist and are keeping this product on the market. Um, I had to undergo uh, a, a damage control operation to pick up all of the pieces um, that they left behind. I was in the hospital for just shy of two weeks. I had a blood clot to my lungs. I've had lung surgery and most recently last month back surgery to um, take a piece of tumor that has grown there. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a long year and a half, I guess. Um, in the interim though, we, um, we went to the hospital and we said, um, guys, this should not be happening. We had no idea morselation happened. We didn't realize, we did a quick number crunching and realized that their estimates of this occurring in one in 10,000 women was grossly wrong. For someone like me who walked into um, their uh, OBGYN complaining of the symptoms I have, the incidence of um, occult, meaning unknown um, uterine sarcoma was somewhere in the ballpark of 100 to two, one in 200 to 500, most estimates. So, so incredibly. Well, I think that gives everybody a good idea, a very vivid idea of what we're talking about today. Um, so I welcome you, Dr. Thank you. Chesum, thank you so much for joining us. I don't know if my microphone is working here. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, good. Is mine working? No? Okay. How about this? Is this better? Closer. No? We can sit at the table if we need to. I think those should work. Right. Oh, there you go. Sure. So first of all, um, I wanted to thank um, Roseanne and Nicole for having me back here again. Um, you know, I wish I could I could say it's a it's a privilege to be here. Um, you know, I think um, it's more um, at this point in my life of a, of a duty to be here actually and to inform and educate a uh, crowd like yours. I just, I just want to have one question for everyone. How many in this room had actually heard about the power morselator? Okay, that's better than last time. Um, what you're looking at there is, is a public health hazard. Um, that was going on in this country for over 20 years. That was affecting one out of 350 women who were being subject to that operation. Um, and was devastating their lives by caught, taking a stage one cancer to a stage four cancer and dramatically reducing their lifespans or leading to their premature deaths. Um, it's a public health hazard. Um, I think it's, at this point, it's a foregone conclusion that FDA's um, statements and, and guidance has, has clarified that, number one. But number two, I think it's a bellwether case for anyone with a legal mindset in the medical device space in particular. Um, and I think Nicole and I will, will uh, discuss some of this, but you know, basically, um, just as a, as a sort of a framework. In the medical device space, we have a, the vast majority of devices going through a regulatory mechanism, um, getting onto the market, which is extremely lax with respect to safety, pre-market safety testing. This thing is called the 510K. Again, again Nicole and I will discuss yeah. it. Yeah, so um, let's talk a little bit yeah, about yeah, absolutely. the 510K You want to just get started? Process. Yeah, absolutely. If, if yeah. you don't mind, let's sure. talk a little yeah. bit about the 510K process yeah. and how that might differ from pre-market approval Right. in exactly the way that you said, the right. safety and efficacy testing. Right. So, so you know, th there's, a, there's a, you know, very dramatic uh, mismatch between the way drugs are regulated in, in our country versus medical devices. Medical devices, for the most part, are going through uh, something called the 510K, which originally was designed sort of as, a, as really a loophole to keep pre-existing devices on the marketplace. Um, and, um, you know, basically it relies on um, the idea of, of similarity to a predicate device 
Uh, what that means is that the company could basically claim that this device is like this other device that's already on the market. And if you know a few uh, guys or gals sitting at the FDA agree with that concept, well, you know, you get this stamp of clearance that goes into the market. The problem then becomes that the the surveillance mechanisms and reporting mechanisms are are totally lax. First of all, the surveillance mechanisms currently for medical device adverse events are essentially non-existent. They're they're essentially purely theoretical at this point in time. Uh, the FDA is working on a unique device identifier system to link it to medical records and actually you know. Uh, uh, make that data amenable to mining, but that's at least 10 years away, assuming that, you know, the politics don't get in the way. On the second, um, the second sort of stage of, you know, regulation could come with, with reporting. And I think what, what my wife and I ended up accomplishing was we reported this, right? I and mean, we were patients and physicians, you know, 20 years go by, not a hospital, not a manufacturer, not a single doctor's bothered to report this. And this was confirmed by the FDA and by the GAO uh, investigation. Um, so here we have total laxity in reporting, and then on the flip side of it is, okay, well, let's, let's say we get a report, right? What happens then? Well, I can tell you right now we're four years into this thing, and the FDA has uh, issued warning letters, but not a single manufacturer, not a single hospital corporation has been prosecuted for a failure to report these adverse outcomes that they were aware of, right? So the regulatory te teeth and the, the, the sort of, you know, um, the, the kinds of... Um, um, you know, uh, DOJ type teeth that are required to, you know, um, uh, make an example of these failures, I think are extremely lax in the medical device space. So I would propose to you, and I think a lot of people think this is an extreme uh, statement, but I would propose to you that in the medical device space currently in the United States, there's a massive public health hazard at work, and it's called 510K. And it's compounded by the fact that surveillance is non existent essentially. And reporting requirements are neither um, uh, enforced nor punished when failures occur. So in that space, you have a lot of entrepreneurs making a lot of good money, um, make, you know, putting out medical devices under the guise of innovation, right? Um, and no feedback from the marketplace. And again, I think Nicole and I are going to go through some of the civil litigation issues related to the power more. So then you'll see that the civil courts are extremely weak in that domain as well. Um, so. So let's go back a little bit to the 510K process itself. And you mentioned that it's based on a predicate device. It's based on a showing to the FDA. So in order to get a, a device approved, for those of you who aren't aware, through the 510K process, you essentially just have to prove to the FDA that it's like this device that already went through the, the full blown pre-market approval process. And it's like it in a way that makes it safe and effective in the market. So there's no independent showing, am I correct, That's right. of safety and efficacy. So that was the case with this power morselator device. And I think it was initially approved in 1991. So it's been on the market for 20 plus years at, least, yeah. Yeah. at this point. And what, what I just heard you say was that you and Amy made the first report in 20 some years, right? Well, you know, that, that's at least what the FDA and the Government Accountability Office investigation demonstrated, you know, right. that, that 20 years have gone by and there's not a single report of this thing, you know, causing harm um, to, to women. So, so, you know, I think one thing that I just want to sort of clarify is, is, you know, many of you may know this already, is that, is that there is a, a distinct mechanism from 510K in the medical device space called the pre-market approval mechanism, which is much more similar to what we go through for drug approval, so that it requires actual clinical testing. And many of the devices that are classified as type 3 devices go through that path. But it's really a minority of devices that are classified as a type 3 device and, and therefore aren't, uh, are, are subject to any sort of real clinical testing. And this so was a type 2 This device, was a type 2. This was right? classified as a type 2 yeah. device. And incredibly, the new iteration of it that came through the FDA after all this hubbub that was generated and all this uh, publicity and the FDA action, the new iteration of the device was again classified by the FDA as a type 2 device. Okay? Which demonstrates to you that, you know, that the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health essentially is, is suffering from a massive laxity. And, and you know, I tell you, you know, we sit here and we look at these devices, they have FDA labels, they're being used by, by practitioners who have medical licenses, okay? But really, you have a public health hazard that's being masked by our process, okay? So unless, you know, a group of regulators, attorneys, um, you know, Justice Department folks actually are willing to actually look at this carefully, I think they're going to, this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are going to be a lot of devices out there that are, that are tapping into our federal uh, health insurance investments and are causing harm and are just completely masked. 
Well, and what's what's not lost here is the fact that Amy wasn't the first victim. Amy was just the first report. There were many, many unknown victims, and I, I don't recall the statistics. Is it one in 400 or one in 300 women who undergo these types of procedures with the power, or did in over these 20 years with power morselators, who then ended up getting the same type of cancer that Amy got and passed away, and there was no reporting, no accountability. Yeah. I mean, to, to be clear, the device does not cause cancer. The device takes a stage one cancer and spreads it and converts it to a stage four cancer. So stage one cancer, in many cases, is curable. Uh, you know, stage four cancer is not. Okay? So, so uh, which brings us sort of to this idea of, um, I think the next topic that we wanted to discuss was, was this notion of a product defect. Right. right. Um, is uh, Focusing specifically on the power morselator, is the product itself defective? Well, so, so one of the comparisons that I've, I've drawn, I think, uh, in, in thinking about this, is you all are probably familiar with the Ford Pinto case, right? Okay, so, you know, classic case in, in legal circles. You know, I, you know, I think it's a, a pretty strong argument to be made that what you're looking at in the power morselator is actually the medicine's equivalent of the Ford Pinto, if you will, okay? So, yes, in fact, you know, hospital corporations, including the Brigham Women's Hospital, knew about this hazard. You know, that's sort of a proven fact at this point. Their executives knew about this. There were other patients who'd been harmed. They failed to report to the FDA. The executives at, um, you know, companies at Johnson & Johnson stores were aware of this, failed to report it to the FDA. You know, they, they put some sort of uh, underscore in their manuals and, and as a warning, but they never took it to the FDA or warned anyone about it. So this notion that, you know, what is a product defect? You know, I think, you know, the argument that's been put forth to defend the power morselator is that this wasn't a product defect. We just didn't know this was happening. Well, the answer to that is negative. You know, um, here's the point. The product's purpose is to take a large tissue and to get it out of a small incision, right? That's the purpose of the design, the design of the product. That, so this, this product accomplishes this very well. You saw that up there, right? It's, it's essentially a meat grinder that goes into a tiny incision, grinds a big tissue up, and sucks it out. So it does what it's designed to do, right? But in the process, it exposes 100% of the patients who it's used on, whom it's used on, um, to the risk of tissue dissemination. I mean, you saw that, right? I mean, you take a big hunk of tissue and you grind it up and it's, it's spreading tissue everywhere, right? So that's the defect, okay, because, and why is that a defect? It's a defect because it can cause harm in a certain frequency of people that's totally avoidable, right? So if you remember, the Fort Pinto, the design did its job, right? The, the, the design of the gas tank was, it was supposed to, A, harbor gas, B, deliver it to the engine, right? But the problem was, and it did that, right? But the problem was it, was, it was sitting too back and too high. So in a certain frequency of cases, when the car got rear-ended, it would explode, right? Now, Ford man manufacturers argued in that case that, look, you know, the frequency of mortality from that defect is no different from that, in that automobile, is no different than the general population of automobiles, right? But in reality, yes, that's true. The frequency is not the issue. The issue is that this particular cause was, was a totally avoidable cause and due to a design def defect that was, that was intrinsic to the machine. Now then the, the next question becomes, well, who knew about this, right? If you didn't know about it, right, then you can't prove any sort of, you know, you know malintent, if you will, right? But if you knew about it, right, or, or for the course of time, in the course of 20 years, it became clear to you, right, that yes, a certain frequency of women are being exposed to this hazard and are experiencing adverse outcomes and dying from it, and you don't report it to the FDA and you don't report it to you know any federal body. Well, then you know I would submit to you that that's actually uh, that actually falls in the category of, of, of criminal activity. You know, um, and you guys are lawyers. You you know you know better than I do. Uh, now, unfortunately, in this medical device space where you know there's lax regulation for getting things onto the market, there's lack there's absent surveillance and there's lax reporting, okay, when federal authorities become aware of this, all they do is they generate a letter, right? Well, wait a minute. You generate that letter, what about that executive who knew about this uh, five years ago? What about that device manufacturer who knew about this 10 years ago, right? There were individuals in charge of the machine, right? And if, they don't, if they're not held accountable, um, you know, I think by, through some process, 
it's completely insufficient to rely on the civil court system because the vast majority of citizens end up going to lawyers who basically want to settle these cases. And once you settle these cases, they get gagged gag and bound, and no one knows anything about what ha actually happened inside these corporations. So that's you know sort of the you know, the defect. I, I hope yeah. I'm not being too verbose here. Well, we, we got sort of into the next topic as well, and that is who's responsible to fix this. And we talked a lot about the regulators, FDA and the 510K process maybe lacks, the post-market reporting process. Let's get into that a little bit more because I, I think we, we didn't tease out the post-market reporting process um, so maybe you can speak to that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So, so uh, you know, just a couple of things. So, so there is no active surveillance mechanism in place for detecting adverse outcomes with medical devices. In theory, the FDA can push a button and say, you know, we think you should survey this device. But it really happens in the, in the vast minority of cases, okay? So there's no real active surveillance going on, right? There has to be some intentful willpower on the part of some regulator to say, survey this device, right? That's not happening in the majority of cases. In terms of the reporting, well, the power morselator just demonstrated that, you know, reporting doesn't necessarily happen, right? As long as sort of there's this utilitarian train that's making money for people and you can cover it up under standard of care and it's got an FDA label on it, there's very little incentive for anyone to report these adverse outcomes because it's just liability as far as the corporations are concerned. So that they won't report it. Who's required um, to report? In terms of the legal requirements, so, so uh, let's, let's go through the requirements. So, so the ethical requirement, as delineated by the Code of Medical Ethics uh, from the AMA, and, and, the, and the AMA's Code of Medical Ethics is, on, is very specific on this, you know, that an, an adverse outcome or deaths, you know, caused by a medical device have to be reported by the individual physician to the FDA. Now, the language on that is extremely specific. Uh, I think it's opinion number 8.032. You, you guys can look it up in the AMA's Code of Medical Ethics. So there's an ethical requirement. But, you know, ethical requirements aren't codified in the law, so no one's got to follow them. You just have to be a good person to follow ethical codes, right? Of conduct, right? So, but in terms of the law, Nicole, it's manufacturers and hospitals. Doctors, individual doctors have no mandate, no legal mandate, you know? And that's something that Amy and I tried to change. You know, Mike Fitzpatrick, for, um, you know, our congressman from, from Bucks County and Louis Slaughter, who unfortunately recently passed away in New York, proposed the Medical Device Guardians Act. And the point was to create a more robust reporting framework from physicians. And, you know, the idea there was to follow sort of like the military surveillance, you know, method, methodology. So you have eyes in the sky, satellite looking at topography and, you know, enemy movement, and you have boots on the ground reporting too. So the Medical Device Guardians Act was boots on the ground. So the expert physician is the one who has access to the most information, most high fidelity signal to report to the FDA. And that was basically Amy and I in this case, right? I mean, Amy and I understood what this was you know, from a, from a medical perspective, unfortunately after it happened to her, and we were able to report it to the um, appropriate uh, body. Um, and that, you know, reporting mechanism is what's missing from experts, um, you know, with, with, with actually a investment in, uh, investment in, the, um, uh, in the process. So, that, you know, I think uh, it's very important to consider why it is that the physicians are not uh, required to report. Okay. So who's responsible to fix regulators? We talked about the medical community with the standard of care and with potentially increased reporting. Um, let's talk about manufacturers and corporations a little bit. Um, you mentioned civil liability, going, you know, being held accountable in court for money damages. But there's also the, eth the corporate responsibility and ethics side of it. Um, Certainly, if there's not a rule or a law, no one can enforce that. But do you feel that corporations are generally following codes of ethics? Do you feel that it, you know it's something in the future that can be pursued? Well, look, you know, so so the way I frame it, you know, I think I think the vast majority of people we come across in corporate America are good people. Okay, they go home every day, they feed their kids, they put them to bed, they read a story of that fact. So it's not you know it's not that we're dealing with bad people, right? Um, it's that, you know, when you have a, a product or a service that's, you know, is somehow benefiting the vast majority of cons consumers or is somehow, you know, preferred by the vast majority of consumers, money's being made off it, right? 
it's very easy to then sort of forget about the minority substance of people who may be getting harmed and to ask yourself the ethics question, right? And particularly because it's a liability issue, right? I mean, it's, it becomes a, and so, so the issue, the, the notion of, you know, sort of pushing corporate ethics and, you know, thinking everyone's Mother Teresa, I think is, is basically, you know, for lack of a better term, it's bullshit, right? I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, you, you know, when there are billions of dollars at stake, yes, most people are good, okay? But unless you have a regulatory framework that's ensuring the safety of minority substance of people, and, and you know, we live, fortunately, in a society where the vast majority of people, you know, actually are okay. In America, America is probably the only civilization in the history of time where the vast majority of people are okay, right? I mean, and, so, and so really the challenge is how do you protect the minority substance of people from this utilitarian train, right? And so in terms of corporate ethos, I, you know, I just, I just don't think unless you have adequate liability signals or ad adequate regulatory signals, you know, I don't think relying on this notion that, oh, we're all just Mother Teresa and we're all going to hug each other and sing Kumbaya is going to work, as it didn't in this case, right? I mean, this is, you know, they knew for 20 years, and that's, in a that's vacuum. sort of a fact. It's not going to work by itself. It's not going to work by itself. But maybe a component um, yeah. of, the, of fixing the problem? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think the vast majority of corporate executives in America think they're good people. And if you actually interact with them, they seem like they're good people. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying, you know, the question but is... that's not what you, motivates How do you protect the minority subset of people who may be harmed by right. the product, you know? And that, 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 I think, is where the U.S. government comes into play. Let me just check our time here. Okay. Um, so tell us what you've achieved so far and what's left to... What work is left for you? Okay, well, um, you know, I think for the most part, the power more slayers off the shelves. Um, we just... Uh, a survey just came out from the Society of Gynecological... <laughs> Um, the Society of Gynecological Surgeons, and they basically, um, it's very clear that what the gynecologists are fearing is not that they're what called cancers that women could be, could be spreading from it. Rather, it's the fear of litigation. So they're scared of you guys, right? It's not because they're worried about cancer. It's not they're, they're worried about patient safety. And this came out you know, last week in the Society of Gynecology. The reason why the vast majority are no longer using it is because they're scared of lawyers or because their administrators and lawyers internally have pulled it off their shelves, which is just a, I mean, it's just an unbelievably striking thing, right? So, I, I, you know, I think, unfortunately, in this particular case, uh, the only way the gynecologists could be regulated is through external regulation, and I think that there's a role for federal bodies like the FDA, like the CDC, to come out and actually put out guidelines and say, look, you guys can't do this, or you can't do it like this, which is what the FDA did. Yeah. So, you know, our next target really is um, to somehow stimulate the CDC to um, put out a guideline to gynecologists that says, look, you know, before you do anything with women's tumors, you know, you got to biopsy them. Currently, that's not happening. And so I think, um, you know, one of, one of Amy's major goals and one of my major goals is to actually induce the gynecological uh, specialty to actually, you know, behave like every other surgeon does, every other reasonable surgeon does, and go in and biopsy these tumors before they resect them in non-oncological ways. So, can we take questions? Okay, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, it's sort of a medical question. So, so there are two ways to biopsy. Either biopsy preoperatively using an image guidance, right? Or you biopsy intraoperatively when you're staring at the tumor before you touch it, right? So, so the answer to that is yes, there's something called a needle track spread, right? That could happen if you're doing preoperative biopsy. But I'll tell you what, it's better than that. Yeah, yeah. Okay? I mean, like, yeah, it's just, you know. And then the second thing is if you do it intraoperatively, right? then you're right there. And, and, you know, the bottom line is the gynecologists aren't doing it at all. And that brings us to the question of the standard of care, right? right. I mean, what do you do when an entire guild is practicing something that's, that's a negligent standard of care? You know, right now in the, in the legal realm, the, um, the standard for litigation uh, in medical malpractice cases, as, as you know, is a breach of standard. Okay? So you have to demonstrate that there's a breach of standard. Well, my, my question for you folks is, what if that standard is actually systemically negative? Like, like if you look at it and say, okay, this guild is actually doing something that every other guild would look at and say this is a negligent standard. And I can tell you, thoracic surgeons, general surgeons, look, if, you have, if you're a male and you have prostate to, you know, mass, that mass will not come out unless it's biopsy. Has anyone had a prostate biopsy here? 
I mean, it's a personal question. <laughs> yeah, please raise your hand. But you know, so so, so you know, that would you know, you, you, the the prostate biopsy is at the at the core of you know the decision to resect the tumor and how to resect it. If um, the urologist doesn't do a biopsy, the urologist will not operate. Now, why is it that uterine tumors are treated any different? You know, I mean, you know, people say, oh, it's sexist. Well, yeah, it's sexist, but you know, it's. It's more than that, right? It has to do with how gynecologists train. It has to do with, um, you know, um, just sort of preconceived notions about what a biopsy does. I mean, you know, most gynecologists will claim that you wouldn't be able to detect this by biopsy. Uh, the answer to that is bullshit. You can't. Just based on that video, Doc, the divorce later and how it works, to me, it seems like even as a lay person, seeing that, knowing very little about cancer, that the one thing you don't want spread before you aggravate the cancer, the higher the likelihood of the chance that it will spread. Was there any portion of the, the, the doctors in the medical community said, I'm not touching that? Because just by the look, just by watching that one video, for me, I would say the one problem is you're, is you're, you're, you can just see the, the tissue and all the matter flying around. I mean, were there some doctors that I would not use that? So there, there were some, but it was a vast minority. Wow. But the, the advantage of this is that it allows you to take yeah. a big t and tissue out of a small incision. and. That sells to women, I guess. You know, small incision, less it's cosmetic, blah blah blah, right? Uh, but, but that's a great question, right? I mean, it's it's like how could it be that that you know? I mean, you you're looking at this thing, saying to yourself, Jesus, you know, like, and, and that's the appropriate response. Most surgeons look at that and say, What are you guys doing? You know, like how could you possibly be doing that? And that's a statement on the fact that this specialty is very spy silent. So if you look at the training paradigm for GYN surgeons, gynecology is the only specialty in surgery where um, the practitioner does not receive a liberal training in surgery. Okay, so if you want, if you go to a urologist, that urologist has done about a year or two years of general surgery. If you go to a plastic surgeon, minimum of three years of general surgery. If you go to any other surgeon, they've trained in other in, in a broad way. Gynecologists train in a silo, right? And so, how do they adopt this thing, right? When every other surgeon looks at it and says, "You guys are out of your minds," right? And how does the patient not see it? The patient doesn't see it because the doctor views this as a minor technical detail. They weren't even consenting the patients before Amy and I. So, so the first response the gynecologist made was, okay, we're, we're gonna consent our patients to this. I mean, they were viewing this thing as a technical detail of their operation. So you'd never see it as a layperson, right? Right, and now they're gonna consent you. So let, okay, so let me ask you this. How does, it, how does an informed consent protect the patient from that kind of harm. It doesn't, right? If you're a woman, you you don't believe you have cancer if the doctor tells you you don't. If you're a doctor and you're doing this, you don't believe she has cancer, right? But if she actually does have a cancer that you haven't looked for, that informed consent is just sort of a medical legal device. It's not It's not a patient safety device. Yeah. That kind of goes to, you kind of answered some of, of uh, the topic that I was going to bring up as, as when she says this is something that is only used on women. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a red flag for me. But um, also, the, I'm wondering if the issue of the fact that the actual device, and you touched on this a little bit in the defective device uh, discussion, the actual device didn't cause the death, the cancer did. So was that an issue when doing research and finding evidence of this happening? So, so I'll, I'll correct you. The, the, I'm sorry if I, if, I, if I may correct you. The device did cause the death. Because, so, so did the gas tank on the Pinto cause the death? But what I'm saying is, like, on a death certificate, would they put this device, there they would put cancer. So, was that a, a reason for the difficulty in finding evidence against the, what this uh, device is doing? Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I guess I'm, I'm sort of having trouble understanding the, the logical sequence of your question. So, 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 so the... So, how do you gather evidence or is it just because of the nature of what the device does? This is automatically something that you can show. Yeah, so, so, so in the surgical profession, right, <laughs> as, as, like, there, there, are these, there are these sort of bedrock principles that we follow, right, that have been around since the time of Halston. You know, the Halstedian principles of surgery dictate that if you have a tumor and it has malignant potential, you have, if you decide to resect it, you should resect it on block with good margin. So there are, there are virtually no surgeons that take any tumor, right, except for gynecologists, right, who take, who take a tumor that has malignant potential and just, you know, chop it up to get it out of small incision. It just doesn't happen, right? So why is it that this group of surgeons is accepting this as a standard of care, right? And at what level does the legal community come into play to say, wait a minute, okay, what happens if a standard is itself negligent, 
right? So you can take individual experts from that guild, right, who will testify that this was their standard. So there is no breach of standard. But if you take 10 other specialist, surgical specialists and say, is this standard safe? They would say no, right? Well, I know we're, I know we're well over time here. So how about one or two more questions and then... Did we cover everything? I think oh, we did. I, I, I think I we did. Did we cover everything you wanted to? I, I think so, yeah. Okay, so one or two more questions. And those of you who need to leave, please feel free to. Um, I'm, I'm just curious. First of all, I've seen you for a few years now, and I just want to state that every year I appreciate your talk more and more, and, and your response to the about you. Um, can you let us know where we stand now with this litigation in civil courts? I know the DOJ hasn't gotten involved, unfortunately, but where do we stand? Is there an open MDL, and are they settling? Okay, so... so um, you know, we're, we're in the midst of litigation, and I, I, I just want to limit, have, make very limited comments, but I think it's actually a very serious failure on the part of the Department of Justice not to have looked at this more carefully. You know, the FBI started looking at this, and then some, something happened somewhere, I don't know, they stopped, right, with the Johnson & Johnson thing, right? So I think, I think it's a dramatic failure in the Department of Justice not to prosecute this, right? Because there are specific individuals who knew specific things and suppressed the information from the FDA and last I checked, if someone violates federal law and that leads to, you know, premature unnecessary deaths of American citizens, we call that a crime, right? Now, the fact that the Department of Justice, the FBI, the OIG chose not to look at this thing and decided to just hand a, you know, um, just a sort of a warning letter to the Brigham Women's Hospital, to, to Johnson & Johnson, to stores, I think is, is going to go down in the archives of, of history in this particular space as a government failure, I think, okay? So, and again, I, I mean that with all due respect to, to all the representatives of the federal government here. Um, you know, um, but, but, I, but I do think it's a failure. Um, so that's number one. Number two, in terms of the civil litigation, unfortunately, the vast majority of these are, the people who've been harmed by this are, are average Americans, right? So when, when an average American, when a corporation hangs $250,000 in front of an average American, they settle and they gag, right? And so because this case is so complex, the vast majority of attorneys aren't really wanting to go through the litigation process. They see it as risk to take it to court, right? So not a single one of these cases, despite the hundreds, has been litigated yet. I mean, it's been litigated. It's never gone to public trial where, like, regulators could look and say, hey, wait a minute, you guys knew this? And you didn't say it. So everything is hidden. And every one of these settlements basically is, is, a, is a gag, right? There's a gag order that comes with every single one of these, right? So no one knows who knew when, what, and what. Um, so I think it's a, it's a pretty serious, you know, um, you know, it's a naive stance to assume that the civil courts will be able to take care of this. It requires plaintiffs who are willing to push their attorneys to go to court, right? And in the vast majority of cases, that doesn't happen. So. How about one more question? Uh, if, if I understand it correctly, this would be uh, like a minimally invasive procedure? Well, it's maximally invasive through small steps. Yeah, yeah. well, we'll but uh, I was just wondering if there would be any circumstance, and I, I don't know what that would be, but where the patient might be in otherwise such bad shape that this might be their only, that the risk inherent is actually... Well, so that's the claim, thing. right, that the gynecologist made, right? And that's why the, ultimately they convinced that the lobby groups not convinced the FDA to keep it on the market and not ban it, right? Was that, okay, if you're a woman and you're very large, you may benefit from this thing, right? You know, I can tell you, like, again, this is a surgical issue, right? From a surgical perspective, I mean, you know, general surgeons do gastric bypasses on, on people who are, have BMIs of like 50, right? So this idea that you need this meat grinder to get this thing out is more of a statement on gynecological ineptitude and in technical training than it is the requirement for the device. The, the, other, the other thing that they've said is that women who want uterine sparing operations need this device, meaning that you want to get, you want to get pregnant, right? That, that's just bullshit. You know, that's, that's purely you know, just hogwash. You don't need to morselate a tumor in order to preserve a woman's uh, fertility capacity. So th both those points are basically driven by lobby power. And again, it's another indication of how corrupted the Center for Devices and Radiologic Health is. I mean, that particular you know, domain in the FDA is operating with very lax regulatory standards. It has no surveillance, and it doesn't take reporting seriously. So, so it's essentially a marketing agency. For, for, you know, and, and again, I, mean, I would, I would, I would um, challenge all of you to convince me why the CDRH is not posing a public health hazard by operating predominantly on 510K without active surveillance and without robust reporting requirements. 
it's a public health hazard. It's a federal agency that's causing a public health hazard. And this thing is just one example. This is a real quick question. Isn't the adverse reporting uh, regulations required under medical devices? I mean, aren't it they is. acceptable? And you're saying to me no patients or According to the FDA and the GAO, they went back in their files and they looked. Amy's was the first one that came through in November of 2013 after 20 years of marketing. Because the patients wouldn't necessarily have the access. The patients wouldn't know. They right. wouldn't know. Yeah. But, but, you know, the hospitals and the manufacturers clearly knew. I mean, they, they just, I mean, you know, it's like, it's like the FDA handed them a letter of warning, for God's sake. You know, they knew, right? So I want, you know, folks in here to tell me if you violate federal law, right, and people die, Americans die, right? I mean, look, we go after like these threats that you know have to do with one or two Americans. Like, you know, look, you know, something happened at YouTube yesterday, right? Three people got shot, right? I mean, the FBI has you know mobilized this massive force to go after it and figure it out, right? Three people, okay. One out of 350 was the incidence of this thing for 20 years, being done on 50 to 100,000 American women. Do the math. Which one's a bigger threat to public safety? And you know, if federal regulators don't address this, then who does? Civil courts? Well, you know, civil courts are in the business of settling and gagging, unfortunately, not in the business of solving problems. So. All right. Well, join me in thank you, thanking Dr. Nachaplan.